it won't be it won't be 10 minutes or anything i i might okay I might if it is it's fine i might give it a couple of minutes for them to get to the front of the line Fantastic. All right, yeah. And then you can just move back and forth. Yeah, perfect. All right. Yep. We are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm getting just a couple of people still in the line back there, so um, y'all don't mind me at all. Um, it's already quarter after, so we should probably go on. Uh, thanks, good to see you all. Glad you're back. Um, Thanks for coming up to the uh, other room here and uh, working with us on that piece. Um, are we definitely going to be in the community room for the last two? Do we know? Um, I think I guess we're here for next one. For next week, yeah. okay. uh, we'll, we'll, be last week. we'll be back in here next week and we're not sure. We're going to try and get the community room. Okay, that'd be good. Next week is the yeah. panel, I think. And so that'll be Dr. Nelson. And okay. Well, um, we won't let you forget. Uh, we'll send emails um, to make double sure that everybody knows where to go. Um, but, uh, but thanks for getting up here. Uh, I will pass around attendance. Um, I had to print this hastily before I came. I had to do everything hastily today. Uh, it, was, it was one of those, if you know what I mean. So it is on two sheets here. So particularly just the last, uh, I don't know, last 15 or so folks alphabetically by first name or on this second sheet. So uh, just try not to lose either of them and um, don't sign uh, to let me know that you were here just like last week. Any questions um, before I get into the material for this week? Anything um, following up from last week? Any uh, you know logistics, uh, dates, course assignments? Emails, etc. Anything like that that anybody needs? Yeah. Do we need to do anything to get it? Um, just to show up on our engagement like our attendance, or will that be a bit for us? You're talking about on the UT Engage yeah. thing, um, Monica. Yeah. UT Engage. <laughs> do we need to do anything for our attendance here? There, or that? Uh, that's that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. probably what will happen is. I will provide that attendance record that you're signing right now to you all so that y'all can mark people and engage. That's probably what we'll do. Yeah. Okay. So um, just make sure that you're making sure you're signing in there every night and you should be good. Anything else like that? Questions, problems, concerns? Well, uh, then with that, um, I'll turn it over to our speaker tonight, which is me. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, 
So uh, we'll kind of be split up into uh, sort of two segments tonight. I've got um, a lecture, for lack of a better term, and slides to go along with that, but notes that I'll stick to pretty closely um, to sort of introduce you to this uh, idea of narrative medicine, which maybe some of you have heard of, maybe some of you haven't. Um, and that will probably pretty well take us up till seven o'clock-ish. Um, when I sort of get through these slides and my notes, uh, we'll stop for just a minute, take a short bathroom break. Um, and then the second hour tonight will be um, pretty much entirely sort of interactive, uh, both with each other um, and also with me. So um, I think as I go through this, uh, sort of the relevance of this topic to serving the underserved and kind of all the things that we do here will will sort of become clear. Um, but uh, but we'll we'll start with these slides and then sort of move on to discussion for the second hour. And I hope um, I hope especially in that second part, uh, you'll feel free to um, raise kind of anything you hear uh, in this presentation. Um, ideas that it gives you, questions that it brings up. Um, that's really what we want. So um, as you know, uh, my name is Jonathan Lewis, and uh, frankly, it's because I believe in the importance of narrative um, that I think you should have a little bit more of my background information. I know I gave some of this to you uh, last week, but I can give you a, a very, very short version of it now, uh, especially with emphasis on the parts that I think um, probably most concern our relationship with each other. I was born in 1983. Do the math quickly. Next year is a big year for me. Um, I was born in Alabama. I have lived my entire life in various parts of the American South, especially around Memphis. My professional and educational backgrounds, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, I have spent most of my working and studying life reading, listening to, evoking, and absorbing stories. Stories of all kinds, ancient and contemporary stories, uh, horrible and uplifting stories, fictional stories, true stories. I have studied and heard uh, most of those in my work as a minister, as a chaplain, as a counselor, and a teacher. I am an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. I am a board certified chaplain who began clinical practice in 2008. I hold a bachelor's degree in religion, a master of divinity degree, and a doctor of ministry degree in pastoral counseling. So you're probably seeing sort of the thread of stories. I have studied the most revered and persistent stories of humankind in the form of the world's religions. I have spent thousands of hours in hospital units asking people to tell me their stories and then demonstrating to them that I care about those stories and that I will hold them with respect and where needed with advocacy. I have worked as a therapist, not only hearing stories, but also picking them up, turning them over, sort of analyzing the parts of those stories that maybe have gone unseen or unacknowledged, even unseen by the storyteller, the client in that case. I have taught students at different levels, especially students going into healthcare, about how to draw stories from the people they encounter, especially in a clinical context, and why that's important. I love stories. I believe in the power of stories, and so that's why I'm interested in narrative medicine and want others to be as well. When you don't know the story, it's a problem. When you don't know the story, you're working with incomplete information, sometimes incomplete information of the most revealing and important kind. And that is a problem for almost anyone doing anything. It is especially a problem for doing good medicine. For example, let's say that I am a trained and expert medical doctor and that I am sitting next to someone on the train. And let's say, as the slide suggests, that that train is the Hogwarts Express because I'm in the story and so now I'm on the Hogwarts Express and that's awesome. And let's say that I can tell from the sound of their cough that they have a gravely serious respiratory condition, at the least, that needs to be treated immediately. With no background or introductions, I turn to that fellow train traveler and tell them exactly what I'm hearing 
exactly what they need to do, exactly where and how they could do it. There's no problem at all with the information I gave them or the expertise out of which I gave it, but there is a huge problem with the fact that my fellow trans traveler has no idea who I am, where I come from, why they should trust me, why I'm giving them medical advice. I've not told them my story. I have built no relationship with that person. So the lack of story is a major problem, despite the fact that the delivered information is accurate and critical. Inversely, there is also a huge problem that I don't know anything about their story, about why they are coughing, how long they have been coughing, why they haven't had it treated, why the treatment they've had isn't working, how it affects their life, who else in their life it affects, and so many other things. I may have given them information that would be helpful to someone else with a cough, but not at all helpful to them because of circumstances of their story that make my information unusable, whatever those circumstances might be. And again, there are circumstances that I don't have about them and that they don't have about me. The lack of story cripples what might be otherwise a very important, even a life-saving interaction. And in case you're thinking that would never happen, the way that I described it, because no one would ever turn to a stranger, totally unannounced, with no introduction or background, give them expert medical advice, and then walk away. Right? No one would ever do that, I don't think, unless maybe we're in a hospital or a doctor's office. Because sometimes what happens there is, in fact, an awful lot like what I just described. The obvious problem with the diagnosis on the train is that no one has anyone's story. And I think we know already and instinctively that not having the story is an untenable situation. We know that person sitting next to me on the train needs at least some of my story, and I need at least some of theirs if we're going to have any kind of meaningful interaction, much less a trusting interaction that involves someone putting their life in someone else's hands. That is the case on the train, and it is certainly the case in the office or the clinic or the hospital. If you don't have the story, you have a problem. We all have a story. That is what makes us exactly like each other and totally distinct from each other. We all have a story, and we need those stories in order to know each other well, to relate to one another, and definitely to practice good medicine with each other. We need narrative medicine, or put another way, we need medicine that includes narrative. So what is it? What is narrative medicine? Rita Sharon, a medical doctor and literary scholar at Columbia University is arguably the inventor of the idea of narrative medicine. And she says this, the effective practice of medicine requires narrative competence. That is the ability to acknowledge, absorb, interpret, and act on the stories and plights of others. Medicine practice with narrative competence, called narrative medicine, is proposed as a model for humane and effective medical practice. So you'll notice that Sharon argues that practicing medicine in an effective way requires narrative competence. Not merely that this enriches medical practice or helps it, but in fact that effective medicine requires narrative competence. Jerome says that a good practitioner doing good medicine will need to skillfully elicit, absorb, and tell stories, both the stories of their patients and the stories of themselves and their own practice. Jerome argues, in fact, that this has always been the case. I think she's right. Jerome says medicine has never been without narrative concerns because as an enterprise in which one human being extends help to another, it has always been grounded in life's intersubjective domain. In referring to the intersubjective domain, Sharon is alluding to the inescapable truth, I think, that all medicine and really all life is done in relationship, in relation to other people. So that means that we can't do good medicine without good relationships, and we can't have good relationships if we don't know the story. Narrative medicine, the intersubjective domain, 
person to person relationships. These things are actually as old as time, but we've only in the past few decades started to describe them with the phrase narrative medicine. And we've just started to do that, not because they were new and being discovered, but because they were old and were starting to fade away. The art form of narrative medicine is something that has started to slip away from us bit by bit, and the invention of the term narrative medicine is actually a device to make sure that we don't lose it entirely. In fact, we could say this about many things other than just medicine. And one reason it has started to slip away a bit is the shrinking amount of time available to medical practitioners, and for that matter, a shrinking amount of time for almost anyone doing anything that requires attention. Sharon argues actually that the limited time is one of the things that makes narrative medicine necessary, not expendable. That is, the short time available to all of us doing healthcare is why we need to be super skilled at getting the story, not the reason why we need to leave out the story. Sharon says, despite or more radically because of economic forces that shrink the time available for conversation, and that limit the continuity of clinical relationships, medicine has begun to affirm the importance of telling and listening to the stories of illness. As practice speeds up, physicians need all the more powerful methods for achieving empathic and effective and therapeutic relationships. So the shrinking time available for practitioners to devote to any one patient makes the focus on narrative competence more, not less important. The less time there is to communicate, the more adept we need to be at absorbing and understanding what is said. So we actually need more attention on communication so that the quality of medicine does not diminish along with the time available to deliver it. We all benefit from assigning proper value to personal interaction and storytelling, and our attention to those skills is directly proportional to the quality of medicine that we provide. So to break this down a little further, the characteristics of narrative medicine, as defined by Sharon, are three in key, attention, representation, and affiliation. On attention, Sharon writes, attention is the state of availability of one person to the other, a donation of one single-minded concentration and focus to the needs of the other. This, of course, speaks to the importance of listening. One of the most foundational aspects of narrative medicine, for that matter, listening is central to compassionate and understanding human relationships of any kind. To hear the story, to formulate the meaning, to communicate care, we first have to listen. I might also say that in order to listen, we first have to commit to listen. You might find in medical practice and even in life that it's easier to not listen. And then if you don't consciously commit and recommit yourself to listening to others, that might be something that goes by the wayside, especially when you're stressed, especially when you're in a hurry. So first we have to listen. We have to pay attention. If we do almost nothing else besides that, everything that follows will be better than if we did not do that. And Sharon uses an important word here, a word that we'll come back to later, by saying that listening is really about availability. Are we available to the people that we're caring for? They need our attention and we need theirs if the medicine is going to work. Sharon then highlights the second movement of narrative medicine as a representation. When learners are asked to represent complex events or states of affairs in words, they confer form on otherwise formless situations. The very conferring of form as a short story, a poem, an obituary, a love letter, makes visible an invisible situation otherwise marooned in some chaotic memory. Representation, the telling of a story, necessarily follows the hearing of the story in the first place, but is very important in its own right. The ability to tell the story and especially to convey its impact 
is incredibly important in the contemporary medical environment that relies so heavily on electronic medical records and team-based care. In modern medicine, there is no one person that offers the vast majority of care for any given patient. Every illness and injury brings a crew of physicians, nurses, therapists, technicians, caseworkers, administrators, all of whom might be involved in care decisions and practices. So imparting the gathered story to others on that team, representing the circumstances and the context of the patient being cared for is immensely important in rallying a medical team to operate at its best. Representation is not just a practical skill for accurately handing off information to others, but also an important art form that imprints the story on the mind and heart of the storyteller. Representation of narrative meanings takes what is real for the patient and makes it also more real for the practitioner who then becomes the storyteller. And in doing that becomes part of the story themselves. Representation, good storytelling, connects us to the story itself, allows us to connect others who haven't heard the story, and invests us in the future unfolding of that story and its people. That is the power of representation, storytelling. And third, most importantly as a goal, is what Sharon calls affiliation. A relationship marked by attention and deepened by the mutual recognitions made possible by acts of representation leads us to a sturdy clinical affiliation. This affiliation, of course, is required of effective care. The affiliation, connection, relationship that's formed between a practitioner and patient are the most effective drivers for lasting medicine, as opposed to temporary medicine. When the practitioner affiliates with the patient, to use Sharon's word, connects and relates to the patient, the practitioner is more likely to follow up, to ensure ongoing care, and to offer effective treatment in the first place. When that affiliation occurs, the patient is more likely to return for care, to follow medical advice, to keep accountable to recommendations. A healing effort without a strong relationship is not likely to result in much healing. These movements of attention, representation, affiliation, prove not only beneficial for good medical practice, but actually essential for it. And all of those movements are grounded in the gathering of narratives and their meanings. Affiliation and everything that leads up to its creation is also one of the most important drivers for health equity. Probably already seeing how the establishment of that affiliation between practitioner and patient is much more likely to result in equitable care than doing medicine without affiliation, without story, without context, without relationship. Going back to something we said early on, if you don't have the story, you have a problem. You're missing information, you're missing connection. And without those things, any of us are much more likely to treat the person as a stereotype of what we think they are or assume they are rather than who they actually are. And that stereotype probably comes from cultural, political, educational, systemic misrepresentations or generalizations at best. And at worst, the stereotype might come from harmful, racist, divisive, weaponized lies. If you don't get the story yourself, if you don't actively listen for the narrative from the first person storyteller, you're likely to substitute a different story in its place, consciously or subconsciously. It's kind of like on a social media site, when someone doesn't have an actual photograph as their profile picture, and so instead the site just uses a stock graphic of the gray outline of a human being, right? That outline graphic doesn't tell you anything actually about who that profile is for. What would be better, of course, in terms of your connection to that person's profile is to see a picture of them or even some picture of anything that they chose to represent them and who they are and what they're about. Narrative medicine and its relationship to equity is kind of like that. In doing medicine, are we asking the questions 
to fill in the profile picture and make a real photograph of the person we're serving, or instead, are we asking no questions or few questions and using only the graphic representation of a person that culture has given us or our own biases have given us or that medicine has given us? Are you dealing with a photo or are you dealing with a graphic? Have you taken the time to let that person paint their own picture of who they are, what they're going through, what they need? Or have we skipped that altogether to only deal with what we assume, what someone else told us, or what we've always done? Narrative medicine paints the picture and increases equity. So let me give an example of how this played out in one real life situation that was published. Charles Anderson wrote a piece called 40 Acres of Cotton Waiting to be Picked, where he recounts the story of a medical student and his relationship with Mrs. Green, a patient in the teaching hospital where the medical student worked. Anderson is mostly writing about the writing that the medical student did. So bear with me on the layers here. Early on, the medical student writes this about encountering Mrs. Green for the first time. My resident asked if it were not my turn to receive the next patient. It was. He went on to apologize for giving me such a train wreck. My first introduction to Mrs. Green was extremely unpleasant. The strong odor of bowel incontinence reached me far before I entered the door. The nurse paused at the door and she informed me that this was the third time during her shift that she had had to change Mrs. Green's bed linens and she had half a mind to just let her lie in her own feces the next time unless she could think beforehand to call for assistance. She further reported that Mrs. Green was the most difficult and demanding patient who had been on this floor in a long time. I declined to visit with the patient at this time and resolved to return later. Much later, I returned to meet Mrs. Green. The odor of feces lingered like a sewer and intensified as I approached. After introducing myself and telling her the reason for this encounter, I briefly examined the patient. I determined after my previous attempt to make my contact with this patient as condensed as possible. Mrs. Green was certainly not the kind of patient who endears the staff to her, nor anyone else, I would suppose. Her uninterrupted moaning only added to the agony of the smell. Besides, the patient was most unwilling to impart any information at all concerning her present condition, only pausing from her moaning long enough to complain that she should be taken back to the nursing home. She stated repeatedly that her nurses were cruel to her and that her family had forgotten her, at least back at the nursing home, she could sleep occasionally. We see here the power of narrative, except of course, that it's working in the opposite way that we would like. Before ever meeting the patient for himself, this medical student receives multiple versions of the patient narrative, none of which are from the patient herself, from the resident who is supervising him and from at least one nurse on the floor, maybe others. The medical student has little hope of encountering this patient without preconceived bias because of the curtain of narrative that he has to walk through in order to get to Mrs. Green. This also helps to make clear the power of narrative on health equity. With this sort of patient narrative being passed through the hall, what is the hope that Mrs. Green will be treated equitably without bias? Narrative matters. Without it, these medical relationships can be and often are totally devoid of story, of nuance, of context, and usually are also devoid of understanding or compassion. Importantly, these relationships are not devoid of medicine. In fact, medicine is almost the sole characteristic of the relationship. The only thing that passes between the provider and the patient is medicine. And that is merely a transaction, often a transaction that goes one direction from provider to patient with very little or no feedback loop. Many providers are not trained that anything more is possible or even appropriate. Many patients are not empowered to ask for it. So with no story, no narrative, no meaning, there are only diagnosis and medicine, and those are often ineffective or maybe inaccurate without anything else to accompany them like a good narrative. Think back to the diagnosis on the train. The abrupt medical advice without any context, and the probably confused person who was left to sort out which parts of that were helpful 
or trustworthy or usable. Later in the piece, though, we see how narrative matters in a different way, in a better way. Anderson shares more writing from a medical student. My mind was already on the next patient long before I exited the room. However, as I glanced at the chart, I could not help but realize that she had grown up in a farming community not too far from my own hometown in the Arkansas Delta. As I hurriedly put all of my examination instruments back into my bag, I casually remarked that she had undoubtedly seen a lot of cotton being raised and picked in her lifetime. The comment, although meant only as a way to drown out the moans while I exited the room, had a most curious effect on Mrs. Green. The moans were immediately stifled. I was most interested in this development and watched her expression change as her mind took her back to a time and place she had not visited in a very long while. Her facial expression softened, her breathing patterns became quieter, her limbs became still. After several moments, she began to speak. She did not speak in the halting, grammatically impoverished style that had plagued me during my history in physical, but spoke in a flowing manner that is so characteristic of Southerners. Ms. Green spoke of cotton chopping, a method of hoeing weeds out of cotton fields commonly practiced before the onslaught of herbicides and modern cultivating machinery. She talked of the long rides at the back of a truck to the fields, the dust that rose with your hoe as you made your way with dozens of other choppers. How sweet the water tasted when you finally made it down the long row and back. She described how the grasshoppers would greet them with a song upon their arrival and how these same grasshoppers would bid them farewell at the end of the day. Sack lunches of fried chicken, cornbread, and a moon pie for dessert. Two dollars for a hard day's labor. Oh, and the blisters, those terrible, god-awful blisters. So we get to go along with the medical student here and witness what he witnesses, which is a startling transformation the moment that narrative enters the room. In this case, that entrance is actually unintentional. The medical student was not trying to evoke a narrative for Mrs. Green. In fact, he was trying to do exactly the opposite. He was literally trying to drown out the patient while he made a quick exit, which is bad, not the model at all that we would hold up as how to evoke meaningful narrative from people that you're working with. Even more than that, it was actually on kind of an assumption about who the patient was and what sort of experiences she had. And there's a scenario where the way the medical student did this, it actually could have gone very badly. But in this case, happily, it did not. And the power of story and connection find a way in, and we see how it affects Mrs. Green. The poor technique of the medical student might even make more clear the power of narrative. In this story, the narrative almost literally overwhelmed two people in the room, neither of whom were looking for it or who were trying to draw it out. Narrative enters the room, and immediately things begin to change. Medical student writes a bit about how not only it affects Mrs. Green in ways that he can observe, but also how it affects him. <clears throat> he writes, growing up on a farm, I was able to recall seeing fields covered with choppers, looking like so many two-legged locusts marching across a field. My father had even mandated that I spend a few days chopping. That he was always able to come up with chores such as these when we children had misbehaved. Hence, I view chopping cotton more as punishment than an opportunity to make a living. I felt humbled by this woman and ashamed that I grumbled about the opportunity to care for people in air conditioned comfort while this woman toiled for her labors under a hot Arkansas sun. My next move was purely instinctive. I took this woman's hand into my own and thanked her for her visit. She clutched my hand fiercely with both hers. Her strength and dexterity were uncharacteristic for a woman in her condition. We held hands this way for what seemed like a long time for someone I just barely met, a full minute at least. She ended our visit by thanking me for helping her remember her past life and inquired whether or not I would be coming back. Of course I would. So now the medical student is being changed by her narrative. And certainly their relationship is being changed as well. The identity of medical student and the identity of patient have not left, those cannot be lost in the midst of a hospital interaction, not even if they wanted. But what has been added to that are these other layers of information. 
some information that connects them, some information that separates them, but ultimately layers of information that bring them both into a fuller knowledge and hopefully a fuller trust of each other. Undoubtedly, these two people had very, very different lives, despite possibly being neighbors. But even in those differences, they both seem to recognize something familiar about each other, a common humanity that medicine can sometimes trip away. The narrative is bringing them back to their senses in a way, showing them how they're alike and how they're different, but ultimately showing them that more can pass between them than just medicine. Anderson, the writer of this piece, reflects himself on what is happening with the medical student and Mrs. Green. He writes, what had jumped the track in the beginning was not Mrs. Green's body, but the story of her life. A story rich with people, work, and purpose. In the wreckage of that story, Mrs. Green was not a woman about to die. She was a woman who had already died, a woman with one and only one identity, such a train wreck. By reaching past the singularity of his medical student self and receiving her story, collaborating with it, integrating it into his life experience in and out of medicine, the writer helped her to find her track again. And when she had done so, she also found wholeness, children, love, respect, and help, which is never merely a physical condition. We're seeing how there's a change taking place because of the narrative that is passing back and forth between these two people. The medical student realizes, remembers, that Mrs. Green has more story than what he's been told. The story of her as a difficult hospital patient does not tell the whole story. Not even close. She has a story that not only can he hear, but coincidentally that he can also recognize that is familiar to him. She is an Arkansas neighbor, a kindred spirit, a hardworking, capable, and loving woman who shares some of the same sense memories and meanings of home. That change is not likely to be undone. Change taking place is one that will hopefully increase trust, compassion, understanding, and all of those things will multiply the effect of any medicine that is done. This is the power of what Sharon calls affiliation. This is ultimately what narrative medicine and really what any medicine should be trying to achieve, even with limited time, even with more difficult circumstances than what we see in this one article. No matter what else is happening, we should be paying attention. We should be representing what we learn and we should be trying to affiliate with anyone who opens themselves to receive medicine of any kind. Medical student writes further on about some of the things that go on between him and Mrs. Green after their first visit. He describes many subsequent visits when they would talk with each other, sometimes holding hands, often talking at home and what the day would be like if they were both there instead of in the hospital. Anderson writes this about the two of them. After this visit, the student discovers that Mrs. Green has had no other visitors and is told by a nurse that she had been much more cooperative the past three shifts and that her bowel habits had improved tremendously. While this information may not seem crucial, remember that Mrs. Green entered the ward as a train wreck, a smelly, unpleasant, dying woman whose only care was preparation for an amputation, or so the story went. Nothing good is going to happen here. But in fact, something rather miraculous, a healing of both body and spirit has begun. Concerned about her lack of visitors, the student contacts Mrs. Green's children, explains her situation, and encourages them to visit their mother if they can. Then the medical student writes. The next morning, the nurse in charge of Mrs. Green's care met me in the hallway before I entered the room. She told me that Mrs. Green was acting very bright today, and she was so glad to see her visitors. Oh, and by the way, she has not been incontinent at all, lately. Indeed, when I approached her doorway, there was laughter inside. I knocked politely and was greeted by Mrs. Green, asking for me to please enter. Her voice was stronger than I had ever known it. She was sitting more upright in her bed than ever before. The moaning was absent. What was even more surprising was the room itself. At least six or seven visitors were there, all talking at once. There were also flowers, at least half a dozen containers. Mrs. Green introduced me as the medical student taking care of her. She asked me to come near. Once again, I seated myself on the edge of the bed. I chatted amiably with the family for several minutes. Out of curiosity, I positioned myself and my hand 
near enough for her to grasp easily. The medical student goes on to say that Mrs. Green did not grasp his hand during that particular visit, though it was near and available to her. Instead, she chose to talk with her family in the room about the medical student and things they had shared, volunteering her opinion that he would surely make a good doctor one day because of his upbringing and his appreciation for hard work and hardworking people. As we think of a word that we highlighted earlier, a word that Sharon used to describe the first building block of narrative medicine, a word to describe attention, the word she used was availability. Are we available? Whether or not a patient takes it, is our hand available? Is it near? Is it open to receiving whatever they are comfortable giving? And have we acted in a way that has earned that trust? Have we made available the space for their narrative and for ours that we might receive what they offer us and that they might receive what we have to give? In this instance, and I know in many others, the real hero of the story, so to speak, was really neither the medical student nor the patient. The hero of the story was really the power of story itself. Narrative was the hero of the story. If we want narrative to be part of our own interactions in clinical settings or anywhere else, then we need to think about these questions. Are we paying attention? Have we heard the stories of the people that we're serving? Are we representing those stories to others? and within ourselves? And are we affiliating our own identity with the stories that we're hearing? Those are some of the questions of narrative medicine, and I hope you are inspired to seek some of the answers. I can tell you from experience that if you do, the stories you hear will change you and will change what you do and how you do it. And if you try it, I would love to hear the story of how it goes. That is the last slide I have. Um, we're OK, it's right at 7 o'clock. Uh, let's take a short stretch break, five minutes or so, and then reconvene. If anyone, do you have any kind of restrooms? There's like a large area. It's not just two. If anyone else can follow me, I can take the group out there. <laughs>
because uh, we're going to talk some more. Actually, this points out well. I didn't even know that we were going to be around people tables like this, um, but this is good. So um, it wouldn't be much of a uh, class on narrative and communication and the back and forth exchange if we didn't have any of that. So I want you to talk with each other, certainly to ask anything that you want of me. And here's how we're going to do that. Um, I've got a few questions. I'm going to throw out one at a time. Uh, when I give you a question, the first thing I want you to do is to turn to each other and discuss what that question is. Then we'll quiet down, we'll share any of that worth sharing with the entire group, and then we'll kind of move on to the next piece. All right. So, first question pick out something from the presentation that is helpful to you and discuss that with each other, maybe particularly on. Um, how do you think you might try to incorporate that into what you did? So I'll give y'all several minutes to kind of do each of these. Um, surely you have a long list of things from the presentation that was helpful to you. Uh, so try to pick the best and share that with each other. Go. <laughs> Yeah, we already started. I've got them talks. Discussion question. Thank you. 
Actually, use that something for the room. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked about like body language and like the whole availability thing. Uh, I definitely think just not everyone's gonna respond to it necessarily, but just having that door open, to like you know, be welcoming. I know Dr. Nelson said that you can lose your compassion pretty quickly just trying to like be on top of that. I guess throughout the day. Sure. So. Yeah, as long as you ignore body, I might also point out, I make a point in the presentation to say that the medical student does not demonstrate like good narrative medicine technique. And actually, that's sort of part of the point of sort of demonstrating the power of the narrative anyway. But also, one of the things that he turns to again and again in his writing is um, holding her hand, which is nice because obviously she wanted to do it. But it's a very, very tricky thing, uh, something that I teach an internship at Rhodes College where Rhodes students um, get to make patient visits, of course. And one of the things we go over like a lot before they ever go on the floor is um, touch, the importance of touch, also the danger of touch, uh, not making too many assumptions about touch. Um, and so even though it's a it's an effective device in this story, um, what people do with their bodies in general is really important. Yes, yeah, so we talked a lot about not having those frequency notions coming into a clinic and how there's such a crazy culture around them, especially during hospital care and a lot of other healthcare workers not uh, carrying forward that negative connotation that you're going to have with patient, how much that will affect the care that you're going to do to the patient. Uh, I think a lot of us can really consider the impact that would have, like going into those patient visits, especially with like reoccurring visits or like for me, maybe a family. So yeah, that was yeah, yeah, the frequency notions for sure. That's um, there's no such thing as a vacuum. Um, so you just almost have to assume that if you don't get the real story, 
you will put an assumption in its place, whether, whether you're conscious of that or not. Um, sort of try to try to fill it as much as possible with an actual narrative. Yeah. We talked about like, um, so obviously you want to look at your patient as you know, an actual human being and not just, you know, a wrong page or statistic or anything like that, but also about humanizing yourself. Because if you view the patient as mm -hmm. just another patient, you know, they're going to look at you and see another healthcare provider is telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really care. They're just trying to get you in and out of the hospital. Yeah. So if you humanize yourself, you're much more likely to, you know, get a reaction from the patient to have that kind of personal um, interaction. For sure. Yeah, I say it a couple of times in there, but it's kind of subtle. Um, that narrative medicine as a practice is uh, both the receiving of narratives and also the giving of narratives. In fact, I might say if you were to go and just like Google, you know, scholarly articles on narrative medicine, you might find more that are directed towards like medical practitioners doing narrative medicine practice themselves, like among groups of peers of uh, doing like writing poetry or, you know, um, uh, describing narratives, like patient narratives to each other, um, talking about sort of struggles with burnout or, you know, like maintaining compassion. A lot of, uh, a lot of medical practitioners really go to narrative medicine as a way for them to sort of tell their own story as much as they do rely on it to make sure they receive the stories of patients. Um, I think as a, as a chaplain counselor type, I'm more likely to focus on the importance of the listening, um, but the storytelling is also very important. Anything else in that category? Yeah, I'll look at. So we also talked a lot about um, the importance of making sure that connections that we have with your patient. Um, I think that was brought up in that very not just like one thing you should try to do, like you are just thinking of patients that you should try to make it 50% better just for once. I was like, where are they mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Yeah, and you know, that was a major key. Yeah, and that's a pretty practical tip, right? I mean, that's, a, that's just a thing to try to try to like observably, you know, happen um, and not to be sort of scholarly at all in that way. It's just a sort of good thing to try to do as much as possible. Yeah. All right, well, uh, here's an opportunity to do uh, the opposite. Pick out something from the presentation that maybe you disagree with or that maybe is problematic or that you have questions about and talk about those with each other and where that comes from. Yes, I mean, Right. 
um, was a little bit um, hesitant to be super on board with was the fact that the medical student called the patient's family. We were wondering if um, they got the patient's consent before and if that could be a possible HIPAA violation and just kind of overstepping there. I would agree. Um, I, I often think that myself when I go through this, when I go through this article, when it gets to that part, um, it, it's yet another way to that to me, the, the writer of the article sort of sort of paints the kind of I've got this piece at the end, sort of paints the medical student as the hero of the story, which to me is not the case at all, really. <laughs> um, and that's for many reasons. Um, and and thankful that they ended up having the sturdy affiliation that they did, uh, despite some of the things that uh, I would not tell people to repeat. And that's one of them. Um, there could be other context there details about if he asked permission or what, but um, that also seemed like a bit of a, a bit of a reach. Um, not something to be done lightly, certainly. Good point. Others. Yeah. We kind of dove a little, a little deeper. Um, so just kind of like where the line ends with sharing information outside, like the patient's room. So hmm. we've all worked in a clinic before and there's like safety issues too. And some people are racist and some people are mm -hmm. weird towards women kind of deal. So yeah. like where, how do you like either not take those notions in the room with you? Mm -hmm. Because of that fact. Yes. You're thinking specifically of like uh, information that's shared between like staff members? Right, about? like if, if it's like a safety thing or if it's just like, I don't know, they said train wreck, I guess you could also say like that person crazy, mm -hmm. right? Oh, or are you talking about like instances when sharing narrative is important? Like you should know before you go in there. Right. X, Y, and Z is possible. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's that's consideration. In fact, um, that makes me think of my think of my road students as well. Um, I'm thinking of specific instances where um, road students, and in every case, I'm thinking of it was it was a female student. Um, you know, had at a minimum very awkward interactions with patients, and in one case in particular, worse than just awkward. And um, yeah, then there's all kinds of sort of like hospital procedures to go through to be like for. You know, associate safety, who needs to know about that sort of thing? Um, and in that way, so again, that's sort of back to the storytelling aspect, right? Like, I mean, in general, what we want is good communication among not only team members, not only between team members and patients, not only between team members and family members. I mean, all of that, you know, the better communication you have, the less instances you're going to have of things that go wrong because there's poor communication. But there are certainly instances where you know narrative among you know medical care team members is very important in situations like that that's true um, yeah let's talk about um the aspect when the medical student saw the body once passing like what if the past led to um, some memories that you remember. Maybe something happened where she was going up on the farm, but maybe she never was on the cotton farm in the assumption that it was on the cotton farm. But if she was molested by the farm, so that brought up some memory that uh, was in a situation. Yep. That was one of the statements. Totally possible. Um, I mean, um, you know, but that it, it's, it's on an assumption. I mean, and literally, not even like a let me be present to whatever comes after I state this assumption, right? Literally, like on the way out of the room. Oh, you surely saw a lot of cotton being picked. Like again, happily it went well, but it surely could have gone very wrong. Um, and it speaks speaks, of course, to what we're saying about how assumptions can form negative patterns, whether we're sort of looking for that to happen or not. Like something to be very careful about. Yeah. Mm. And like this situation of like, I know that you know, that you know, 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 you know,
you don't necessarily have been there or right. they can establish you and how that can be a physical where they might have their expectations might change like what we said yeah so i'm going to want everybody to talk about uh, the time issue so i'm going to throw that out of the table question in a minute but what you just said raises something for me um a quick quick poll by show of hands um are you as a uh aspiring or practicing healthcare professional, do you have more sort of nervousness or anxiety about the very beginning of a patient interaction or the very end? Like getting into the room or getting out of the room, like to your point, okay? So show of hands, who sort of has more kind of uncertainty, nervous anxiety about the beginning of a interaction? And who has about the end? That's, that's so interesting to me. So I, I came across this with uh, with my Roche students as well. Again, this was like at the beginning of the semester before they're making their patient visits in the hospital, which they do as part of the internship. And we talked about, I think, I think in that class, we had sort of broken down like the patient visit is four parts. And we sort of talked about kind of like, you know, the strategies and potential like issues with each one of those four. And I was really interested that um, like almost all of our students were much more concerned or had questions about how to get out of the room than they did how to get into the room. I know for me personally, it's always been the opposite. I mean, even after years and years of making, you know, um, chaplain visits in hospitals, I was always more sort of uncertain about what I'm walking into and what's going to happen when the visit starts than I am when it is time to get out. But Extra strategies are important, especially actually in, I think, the situation that you're kind of describing where there has been a connection made, right? Where like it wasn't just sort of, you know, sort of run of the mill, ordinary kind of medicine talk. And maybe you did really kind of get into some stuff. Then, you know, how do you get out um, in a way that honors sort of what you connected over, but also gets you to the next person that you also have to provide care for? Um, I won't say too much more about that because I, I want y'all to all sort of talk about that. So we're gonna we're gonna sort of come back to that. Anything else? Nobody wants to raise on this. Yeah. Um, we kind of talked about how the hand holding might have been a bit excessive, yeah. especially in the case where the family was there, yeah. and he was like, "I just wanted to see if she would hold my hand," yeah. whereas like he should have honored more like the family connection and like just been happy that they were all there and that she had people instead of like going in and kind of making it about herself. Yeah. <laughs> At that point she had plenty of hand holders in the room, right? <laughs> like he was he was not needed for that anymore. No, as, as we talked about that a little bit about that earlier, but um I I agree. Um and especially when it comes to anything involving physical touch. I mean to say nothing of sort of like personal you know, verbal interactions that may happen in a relationship, um, the touching you have to be very, very careful with. Um, yeah, for sure. All right. Okay, next question. What do we do about the time problem? I'm certain because some of you have said it, and even those of you who haven't have probably thought about this, there's no way that I have time to do an hour long therapy session with every single person that I see. So what can't we do? What can we do? What do we do about the time problem? Do you already know of solutions? Have you rounded with someone or do you have like a, you know, a physician that you yourself see or whatever that you feel like is particularly good at this? What do we do about the issue of time? Go. I 
Nobody has the time. We don't have time to learn everything about everybody that you see. So, what do we do about that? Anybody have any good ideas? Yes. Um, I showed an intern as a head of strategy. Uh, so, you know, the first time I saw the page, they get all the information down and you ask them some personal things and they jot down notes about the person like, oh, they like to fish hmm. or anything like that. So the next time they see them, instead of just asking them to generalize, oh, how have you been since I last saw you, which, you know, opens up a giant can of worms and just go on about a bunch of different stuff. The last point of questions like, oh, did you go fishing last weekend? Mm -hmm. What'd you catch? And like a couple like to the point questions and then into the visit. So it was almost like containing, you know, the banter before it actually got down to what they're there for. Sure. <laughs> Any fans of the office? I'm thinking Michael Scott and his cards with notes on the back of them for sharing his clients. It goes wrong in the show, but it's fun. Um, well, that's, that's, that's a good idea and sort of anticipates the second visit, the third visit, right? And sort of like trying to establish right off the bat that I remember who you are and I remember this thing about you and I want to know so, and usually something besides the medicine, besides the illness, right? I think, I think that's, a, that's a good tip. Others, oh, yeah. Um, so we were talking about having like a good nurse. My mom was an ER mm. nurse for a long time. Sure. So she needed doctors faster. So she would try to like knock on the door. And like, I know when I was younger and the pediatrics office, my pediatric, pediatrician was like same, and she would get annoyed by that. <laughs> so she'd like, one of the nurses would like knock on the door and be like, hey, you have to see the next patient. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, a lot of this has to do with the importance of a good team and not feeling like you as whatever discipline you're in have to do it all yourself. Like it, it just it just won't work. Um, and the time is one of the big reasons why if you don't all sort of work together to do all of the things that need to be done, including making good connections, doing that as a team, just as you do everything else as a team is always going to help. Yeah. Just what I'm yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. And, and probably sort of sets the interaction apart from most of the other interactions they're going to have that's about illness or injury, right? Um, yeah, if you, if you find that window, be present enough to see it and take it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so uh, having a good team, definitely. That's a lot our discussion. Uh, we also kind of discussed like another thing that we discussed was finding a good balance between just like we should talk about whatever secret points that at the time and also making sure that you're still there in the conversation including that it's productive for you and it gets what you need to get done done. And this obviously different based on what the practice is because I can't go in the medicine practice perspective whereas we have like an ortho, like a surgeon perspective, but you're going to probably those people are very different. So um, it really depends on the practice, but making sure you find that difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Talk a little bit about knowing when and how to make time when it's important. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to be giving people news that can't fit in 10 minutes. And it's okay to take the extra few minutes or to acknowledge that maybe you don't have it right now, but here's another time that I can reach out to you. Here are resources that I would like to set you up with. And like, it doesn't have to be, maybe you don't have the staff that you can bring someone in to counsel someone, but hopefully if you're very typically giving complicated or uh, like say you're in a design and you're gonna give someone a PCOS diagnosis, you're gonna be dying probably giving PCOS diagnosis with Piece of regularity, you probably have some resources on hand that you can connect with it. So it's just like an acknowledgement to them that what they're going through should take up more space than you maybe have. 
and you're going to make the space for them in what's there. Yeah, yeah, sort of triage me, right? The time. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with it's not like um, you know a, a two minute interaction becomes unholy of any kind. I mean, I, you, you're going to have to do that sometimes because on that particular day, that person is probably okay with the two minute interaction, but it's because somebody else needs the 17 minute interaction, right? Um, and I like what you said too about sort of um, sort of devoting the time, like making sure that that you know you're putting the time in the right places. Um, and that that becomes sort of a skill. I think that's become something you sort of get a feel for after a while. But um, you know, that's 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 great. Yeah. Um, I think for me, like personally, um, the biggest thing is the time. You know, there's instances where you can a lot time more than others, but a lot of the times you're kind of stuck to the schedule. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing is, you know, you know, going into the encounter that you have a limited amount of time. And I think the most beneficial way is to make that time as valuable as you can. So I think it's the practitioner's, you know, job to be prepared going into that counter. So knowing what you're going to ask them, knowing like just more targeted approach so that you're making that small amount of time more valuable versus having like a long drug out conversation that isn't productive at all. Yeah. Yeah. Planning. Right. Um, I think sometimes even sort of acknowledging the lack of time. Well, like you've even been able to say that to somebody that you know for whatever reasons that you don't have the time today that you wish you had, but you hope you have it the next time you see them, you know, again, sort of trying to establish an affiliation or like an expectation that, you know, I'm going to see you again. Um, and even if they know that like, you know, the reason that I'm heading out is because of a lack of time and not because of a lack of care, right? Um, I mean, all of that, that you can plan ahead for is, is better than not, for sure. I, think, I feel like as soon as we started talking, I feel like I heard like somebody right here say, sit down. Did I hear that? I heard somebody say, sit down. <laughs> she thinks it was you, but you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, like a little bit of a magic trick sitting down. Um, Actually, there's uh, there's like a there's peer reviewed information that um, proved that um, if you go in and sit down, a patient thinks you stayed longer than you actually did, um, just just because of that just because of that body movement. Also, so I mean that sort of demonstrates the effect on the patient. It also very much has an effect on you as the provider. Um, you're just more likely. To sort of settle in, to listen a little bit better, to stay a tick longer if you're able to sit down and if you're not. Doesn't mean that every single interaction is going to make sense for you to sit down. There might literally not be a place to sit down everywhere that you see people. But um, when there's when there's a chance to do that, try it. Something something kind of happens. <laughs> it's a little bit unexplainable when uh, when you do that. Okay, last question. Final, final exam here. What does narrative medicine have to do with serving the underserved? Why would we be talking about that in this course? What's it have to do with serving the underserved? Go. <laughs> You can probably address that. I'm concerned about getting off the Thank <laughs> you. 
talk about narrative medicine in early underserved cause. Yep. Okay, so like um do narrative medicine is good to so they get uncovered complexes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you hear about all patients who are women with all the things and so and instead of just making their own brain device. Yeah, the word non-compliant 
is like a one phrase story, right? It's a terrible story. Does it really does it really tell us anything about what's actually going on? But it's a story that, especially in healthcare, we've all come to understand and often even just believe. Like, oh, nice, how's the client? There it is. Well, I know what I'm getting here. You know, and it never really tells the story at all. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh huh. Um, I know we have talked about that sometimes the underserved are some of the people have the biggest stories to tell, mm -hmm. but they're so scared of being judged or looked at differently that they don't trust you enough to tell them, oh, I can't take this medicine because I can barely feed myself at night. So in order to build that rapport with them and build that relationship, relationship you need to be able to have that conversation with them and show them that I'm going to judge you, I'm going to help you. Yeah, rapport, trust. Medicine immensely helps with all of that. Yeah. Narrative medicine helps the provider to not only attempt to feel them physically, but also another that they are both higher. Mm. Because the others are often don't get that opportunity to really have the time to put the provider and tell them about themselves. So with I feel like if you are trained in skill in this way and have the time and attention for that. Um, they definitely benefit on it. I like experience. Like that, sometimes people want to help them with medical medicine. Yeah, as a chaplain, of course, I am immensely interested in the impact of psycho, social, spiritual aspects. Um, didn't really get into that here tonight, but um, but it's an incredibly important part of medicine and healing, and um, certainly often naturally flows from good narrative practices. Yeah. Let's see somebody back that way. I know that I did. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, you talked a little bit about how there are like unknown unknowns in people's life, mm. and you don't know what to ask that's going to cover those. So you just want to build that rapport and give people space. To bring up the things that are waiting on them. Sure. Because I don't know what's going on with you. But you have to tell me, and I have to create the space that lets you come up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like to, to what we were just talking about, to get to psychosocial concerns, you're almost always going to have to dig a little bit deeper. Um, often, like social determinants of health, right, are probably going to be somewhere underneath the kind of conventional medical exam um, and things like that are going to. Take some extra time to get to for sure. Yeah, really liked what Will had to say to remind me that there's always going to be a narrative. Is whether or not it's going to be the true one or the one fake. Sure. And whether that narrative is true or not, that's going to affect how you see the patient, how you talk to the patient, and how you act towards the patient. Sure. That just has drastic consequences on their health. Yeah. Right. No such thing as vacuum. Right. Said that earlier. Um, there will be a narrative no matter what. That's, that's a great point, for sure. Yep. Just to point out, they talk about too regarding underserved populations. Those are the populations that they're usually going to design for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe their whole lives, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in terms of the group by institution, not the institution, the systemic level. So, as you know, a medical institution. Where we can come in and change that interaction so that there can be trust there. If there is a no, there is a judgment. Um, yeah. Um, I think we talked a little bit about compassion on it and how um, really if you take the time to listen to a patient's story and their narrative. You're so much more likely to have compassion for them and to, you know, kind of empathize with them in that way. And um, it kind of reminded me over the summer I did research um, at UT Knoxville, and we actually had a class on compassion all mix. And so a lot of times um, people think that if you have compassion, you're more likely to burn out. But so many studies have proven that if you have more compassion, you're actually less likely to burn out. Um, so I found that to be very interesting. Yeah. I've actually never heard that term. I think just based on your description, I think I know what, what it is, and now I want to look it up. Um, but I, I've just heard that before, and um, I think that's a great point. Okay, everybody. Well, I
We're right on time. That's it for tonight. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Yeah. Did y'all say you'll be in the next meeting? Yes.